Uh, this is Press Start. It's a colloquium of the Kadar Game Center at Shankar College in Tel Aviv. I'm I'm very yeah. early. I'm head of the Masters of Game Design, and uh, uh, with me is Dr. Renard Glusman, who is a senior lecturer in here and a game designer. So yeah, we're super excited that you're here, and we're going to let you introduce yourself, and then we're going to open up the session for questions. Uh, and we're just going to say that we're all huge fans. And we love Journey and everything else that you do. So oh, great. Excited. All right. Well, so what I'll do is I'll, um, <clears throat> if you can uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll just give you a quick run through of, you know, where we're at today. And then we can take questions. I really prefer to, um, <clears throat> to, to have an uh, open discussion. All right. So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, uh, my company is called Phenomena, as you all know, uh, pronounced F-U-N-O-M-E-N-A, -E Phenomena, like Phenomena. A lot of people get it wrong. Um, a lot of people don't know that the plural uh, for my group is Phenomenats, so we consider ourselves explorers, people that are trying to do something new and interesting in the space of video games. Um, so I always include that at the beginning of every talk, just so that you know how to refer to us en masse. Um, Martin and I decided to found Phenomena in 2000. Uh, 12, actually, that's a typo. Um, after, after shipping Journey, we started working together in 2009. Uh, and um, we worked on Journey together. And then um, we wanted to basically build a company that we enjoyed working at. When I was working with Martin on Journey, um, I was the last woman hired on the team and I was never allowed to hire another woman. There was a single vote veto at the company. And I felt that this was really an issue. And uh, over time, I started realizing, especially as Journey won all these awards that um, when I walked around the world and accepted awards, the audience was looking very similar to itself all the time in all the places that I went. So Martin and I thought we should make a, a studio that's diverse, inclusive, and joyful. Um, we should build it together, um, just like we built Journey, um, kind of trying to find the best in every single contributor, um, but do that at, at a company level. So take the game design skills and the production skills that we had together and our, our technical know-how and uh, see if we could build a better company. And that's what we've been doing over the last eight years, almost nine years now. So um, myself uh, and Martin are the co-founders and Jason Haber, who I worked with at EA on The Sims is our director of ops and culture. Um, and we have a lot of experience, just the three of us. Um, but you know, this slide, one of the problems is, is that we're all very white. So um, we've actually been working really hard to change that um, ratio at the company and um, are currently in the process of expanding the executive team, um, but we have built a very, very diverse company below us. So the team that um, exists at Phenomena is essentially com almost completely flat. Um, it's a symbiotic uh, system where everyone works together and everyone leverages all of their experience on all the projects that they worked on. And we have a lot of experience, a lot of people that have worked on a lot of cool stuff um, across a variety of platforms. But um, the stuff that we're known for at the company tends to be um, these beautiful kind of award-winning independent games that are really unique that no one else would make. And so the way that we've managed to build these games, um, which have relatively large budgets, like the Tom was about a five and a half million dollar game, the Luna was a three and a half million dollar game, um, is that we do uh, two tiers of development at the studio that feed into each other. So we have a lower, uh, level of um, four higher projects on new technical platforms. And then we have this um, upper deck of projects that people rotate into and off of over and over again that are what we would call triple I projects. Um, and that has a couple of benefits, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but um, it's, it's actually, um, we wanted to build a more sustainable model where if a publisher canceled a game, for example, the time got canceled two years in and then we had to reboot it, and rebuild it with uh, Annapurna. Um, uh, if something like that happens, um, a partner drops out or we lose a, a gig, we have other things going on so that we're always able to reform and kind of address the situation as it evolves. Um, we are really diverse and inclusive by purpose, as I said, and we believe that the reason that our team is awesome and so flexible is because we have so many different kinds of skills that come from so many different life experiences. Um, no matter where you're from, no matter what your background is, no matter what you've worked on, you're bringing something exciting to the team. And we always try to not only find that, but leverage that and make sure that people feel like they're growing as they 
as they continue in the company. And so a good example would be that um, uh, Brad, our audio director there with the, with the cat piano, um, is just recently decided to um, move on from the audio direction job and move into creative direction on a new game that we're doing that's music and dance based. And so he'll be the creative director on that project. Um, also, my art director recently decided to move into the technical team. So she's going to become a technical artist and eventually lead the tech art team on the new projects that we're working on because she wanted to get more chops um, programming. And so um, we, we really encourage people to move around quite a bit. And, um, you know, if I'm always learning at my job as a CEO, so everyone else should be too. Um, we are over half uh, non-cis white male. So a lot of the people at my company identify as coming from an underrepresented group. Um, and that means that um, we have um, perspectives that are often shared in the company culture around everything from what kinds of uh, core game loops we should be using, you know, how to make them decolonialist, anti-racist, you know, pro uh, collaboration, you know, multicultural things like this um, to, you know, what kinds of inspirations we should be sharing across the team. So we have a lot of people that will submit um, a variety of games, films, activities, activism, all kinds of stuff um, on a variety of channels that we share. And since COVID, we've actually built um, a really strong network of communication outside of the official work channels on the Discord that people use only in the evening. So we have a strong culture where people game together, draw together, watch movies together, and hang out in the Discord chats, as well as building games together uh, using you know the wonderful <laughs> tools that we have right now, like Zoom and Slack, um, to uh, to communicate in real time during the day. Uh, we're extremely Agile, as I said, and we're very lean. So over the last eight years or so, I've raised $35, $40 million in project financing. Um, the company is almost completely owned by Martin and myself. We just started a fundraising round and expanded our cap table to include friends and family, mostly other developers who are supporting us in our first Series A round, um, <clears throat> which we're really excited to be um, raising with the help of a few really great people, including uh, Mike and Amy Morham. So really looking forward to uh, expanding the company now, but we took a long time before we got there. And um, that's actually something that I have a lot of thoughts about if anyone wants to ask. Um, we've really focused on being consistently innovative, but as you can see, we've done a lot of stuff in a lot of weird places. We've worked on the Magic Leap. We've worked on the very first Google AR phone, which is a fantastic project. And um, we've done a lot of work on the Oculus Quest. We just released Luna um, on Quest. Um, and then we also started working on um, a couple other games, which are coming out probably early next year, depending on a bunch of negotiation that happened between Facebook and other people. Um, and so we have a lot of titles coming out, but we've also started working in Roblox recently, which is where a lot of our fundraising has been devoted. Um, I think that one of the things that we're known for is that our games are really artistic and beautiful, but they also really run on any platform. Um, and this is actually something that has become very important as you start to look at cross-platform gaming and online gaming, cloud gaming, um, games that can run on Roblox on the phone and on the PC, um, games that use a limited uh, set of you know, draw calls or whatever because they have to support massive networking demands. Um, and so our team is actually almost half artists and then there's some producers and then there are some engineers. And a lot of our artists are also technical. So, and a lot of our producers are technical. We don't really hire people just to do game design because everybody can contribute to game design and we find that the best ideas come from us all percolating together. Um, but we are really artistically driven and the studio is, I think probably, we're, we're super focused on what's happening in the industry and in animation, uh, next gen uh, rendering, GAN, procedural rendering, procedural games, procedural world building. Um, and our more recent hires have been younger people, students and graduate students who are focused in those areas because we feel like there's a lot of potential with that kind of stuff. Um, so this is the stuff that we've been working on lately. Um, we work on creative games for kids and parents to play together inside of Roblox. We're looking at a lot of PCG and UGC systems for player expression and a lot of the games that we're working on. Um, AI driven content delivery for retention. So I'm thinking a lot about how to deliver content on the fly to someone based on what they've already chosen. Language agnostic communication systems that allow for multicultural gameplay across a variety of platforms. Uh, voice based games and characters. One of the Oculus games that we made is voice controlled and actually has a whole narrative where you interact with a bunch of characters inside a little dollhouse, which is actually really cool. 
And um, we also are really interested in building social and casual games for the whole family that are online as well, where, you know, you can have a character and your mom can have a character and you can both give each other props for the achievements and looks that you put together in those spaces. So that's kind of what we've been working on. Um, and then this is just kind of a list of some of the people that we've spent the majority of our time working with. Um, we spent a lot of time with Facebook right now um, and Roblox. Uh, Magic Leap obviously is less so now that they've transitioned into B2B, but those relationships that we had at Magic Leap are now matriculating into Lego and Snapchat and other places where people are doing AR. So we have a lot of conversations around that and Apple as well. Um, and that's really it. Um, we, uh, we have had a really privileged um, last few years despite the pandemic and we're still here. <laughs> I think a lot of people um, definitely, definitely suffered during the pandemic and we're really excited that we're coming out of it and that we'll maybe get back to our physical office at some point. Um, but right now we're all fully still remote and, uh, and that's the situation that we're in. So I'm happy to take questions. Wow, so many questions. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna start actually with our students because uh, I know they have uh, many questions to ask. So uh, we've made up a list and um, Ophir, uh, do you wanna ask your question first? Yeah, yeah sure. So uh, it's probably like, completely different from what we talked about until now, but uh, it's okay. uh, what do you suggest is the best way to fight crunch in the game industry as it becomes more prevalent in the modern AAA studios? The best way to fight crunch is to not do it. <laughs> and I mean, like literally no one at the company does it. Um, and in your situation, um, wherever you are, whether you're in leadership or whether you're at the bottom of a giant stack or you're somewhere in a, in a flatter system like Phenomena, um, there are two things that you can do every day to make sure that people don't crunch. Um, you can talk about how things are going in your life. So you can be honest and report in about what's going on. And you can remind people that family and health and well-being come well before work. Um, there's no, you don't, work to live <laughs> you know um you live and then sometimes you work and like it's very important to live your life and to have um the capacity to deal with stressful situations and um the best way to deal with stressful situations is to make sure that everyone who's in a stressful situation can acknowledge that they're in a stressful situation like we're not meeting our deadline or i need to re revise a commitment or i made a mistake and it's causing a lot of extra work for everyone and we're gonna have to backtrack and have a conversation with the partner, um, you need to be able to acknowledge those stressful situations up front. And the best way to do that is to have a practice of checking in. How are you doing? What's up with you? How are you feeling today? How's it going? How's your workload? Just you and whoever else you're working with. If you do that at every level of a company or lever every level of an organization, every level of a program, like I run an academic program at UC Santa Cruz as well, which I founded seven years ago. Um, and I made that a foundational aspect of all of the coursework as well. And so all the students are encouraged to know their team's check-in status. Are they you know, red, yellow, or green? Um, and if somebody's in the red or yellow, you have to be moving them into the green. That's the number one priority. After that, then you renegotiate commitments and scope work. Um, the number one problem that people have that leads to crunch is having eyes that are bigger than their stomach, just wanting to do more than is necessary. Um, and like, you know, we, we do it too. Even yesterday we had a we had an art test with Nickelodeon for some project-based work that we want to do with them. And one of my producers wrote them was like, can we just turn it in a day late? I'd really, we would just really want to do a couple of things. And my first instinct was to think you should just meet the deadline and cut, cut that stuff. The chances that they'll notice the difference between A and B are so slim. It's not worth asking for the extra time. It's not worth pushing people harder, just do less, turn it in and say, you know, if we had more time, this is what we would have done. Um, and you have to constantly go back and say, this is the lesson. Next time, just turn it in. It's okay to let it go the, the day that you said you'd let it go. If you really need to revise your commitment, revise for a week and make it perfect. <laughs> one day is not gonna make a difference really. And like, this is one of those things where you have these conversations openly, not in a scolding way and not in a sort of a finger wagging way, but in a, I know where you used to work, this is what you used to do. We don't need to do that here. We make the commitment, we meet the commitment. If we revise the commitment, we revise it to do excellent work. Um, and really like, if it's not a difference between excellent and mediocre, 
then we don't need to revise the commitment. We need to keep moving forward. We need to let, let stuff go. And so I think that really the crunch culture comes from people being attached to success that they have in their mind that is not necessarily real. And it also comes from um, believing that it's, a, it's not okay to just um, to revise a commitment internally and those things pile up and then lead to having to, to push harder so that they don't revise a commitment with the partner. So being open to revising commitments comes at a very core level, it's an atomic skill that every company should have. Um, and there's language around this in most, most co coaching literature, um, which is just know your commitments, check in on your commitments and revise them when you need to. Um, not because you're a failure, but just because you're a human being and shit happens. Wow, words of wisdom. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Um, next question, Bar. Bar, are you with us? Uh, I'm just looking if she's here because she wants a question. Well, I can ask the question for her. Okay. Uh, so Bar asked actually, how has the game journey changed from the original idea or version? Uh, so when Genova came to ask me to work on Journey, I was working at Electronic Arts. Uh, I was a producer there, uh, moving into the executive production track after having been lead designer there for a while. Um, and I had essentially gotten to the top of the design funnel. And I learned that at EA, in order to really progress um, to the level where you had real creative control over like the suite of changes that need to be made to a product to make it excellent, you need to move in production and then up. Um, they didn't really want a designer who didn't have production skills and the ability to spreadsheet and predict, you know, costs and stuff to be in charge of a large product, which makes sense. You know, the first game I worked on there had 170 people on it. And the second game had 70 people on it. It you know, cost like 70 million bucks. So, you know, it's a million dollars a person. So it's a lot of money. Um, and he came and asked me to be the lead designer on Journey. And I took a look at the design that he had. And I took a look at the team that he had. And I was like, you don't need a lead designer. You need an executive producer who can help you cut and snip and like sew together something that you can actually do in the 16 months that you're committed to already, which was a crazy commitment. So they were already overcommitted and didn't want to revise uh, because Sony had given them a specific amount of time and a budget and said, make a game in this time and budget, which is also not a great practice. Um, about 16 months into the project, we had to ask for more money. And then another nine months in, we had to ask for more money. So the project ended up taking, you know, three years. Um, and over the course of three years, we built the game three times. So we built the first prototype with a very minimal art style that we really liked, um, but it was not scalable because Matt couldn't produce the assets fast enough and we didn't have the money to hire up. So then we rebuilt it again with a, a, a highly stylized format that was really almost like cell shaded paper looking um, with really hard edges. And that was much more efficient, but it lost some of the glory that we had in the initial sketches and we felt that the sense of awe and wonder in the, in the visuals was not great. And then finally we came to the art style that we developed, which we developed in partnership with Naughty Dog using a lot of their MLAA technologies and some stuff that they had developed for uh, Last of Us that they were that we were allowed to use internally because we were a second party, almost first party team. We were actually inside of Sony's Santa Monica headquarters for the first half of the game development in a closet, actually. Wow. Um, yeah, we had we had five people in, in a room that eventually became like a really small conference room. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and then, yeah, it was a really, it was very, very, it was very interesting. Said, yeah, very much in line with what you said before. Yes, how uh, yeah. practical and uh, yes, okay. Yeah, so, so cool. we, we eventually became 15 people and had to move into an office, but for the longest time we were very small and we were really, Cram, crammed into this small space there. So we had a lot of contact with the producers and stuff and over time learned about things that were going on actually on that and also on the God of War team that, that could help us. And Martin, my co-founder was the person that was in charge of all the backend systems, including the seamless networking and multiplayer as well as um, the rendering of the sand. Um, he did all of the distributed rendering for the grass and flower and then worked with John really closely on the, on the sand system which took like essentially three years to build. Um, we were really inspired by Media Molecule and we have really close ties with them and Alex, who's now at Google, but um, uh, Alex Evans is one of Martin's closest kind of programmer friends. And we spent a lot of time talking about how every game that we made, we wanted to have a key graphical innovation, a key gameplay innovation and a key um, design innovation, right? And um, for Journey that ended up being the, the design innovation was the connection with the audio 
the gameplay innovation was the, the, the effect of seamless multiplayer and the technical innovation was kind of seamless multiplayer mixed with the sand. Um, and I think the thing that changed the most over the course of the game is that we got rid of a really bad, long, overwritten story that made no sense. Um, the actual background story for Journey originally involved um, essentially a planet-wide destruction and every grain of sand on the planet is the ashes of the people that lived there before. And all the creatures that emerge from the sand are the reconstitution of the life force of everyone that was alive before. If you go back and you play it now, a different with, game. <laughs> with that knowledge, you can see it. It's, it's still in the yeah. story, but it was very explicitly a story about a, a, a group of people that had a essentially a nuclear war, destroyed their entire planet and ecosystem, and then had to use a space needle to escape. And you wake up thousands of years later after this has all happened and you're walking back through the narrative of that failure. And it's in the game, but it's not in the game. It's like my mom played it and she said, Robin, I had no idea you were gonna make a game about Jesus, <laughs> which is just amazing to me. My mom is a devout Catholic, which I am not, I'm a Buddhist. So like, I was like, okay, <laughs> like, I thought I made a game about reincarnation and like letting go of what, you know, what happened in the past and moving forward and accepting that maybe after all humans have annihilated themselves on this planet through climate change, that something else that's maybe a little bit gentler will come after us, whatever form it takes. Um, but that's not, that's not what my mom took from it. So I think that the, the number one thing we did was edit away a lot of overwrought science fiction that came from a lot of, you know, anime and yes, like video novels game that, that, yes. that people had read. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of new stories in this earth and yeah. it, you know, it was based on the hero's journey but a lot of the inspiration for the game came from, I don't know, stuff that, stuff that like, yeah, I mean, you know, like Matt gave, a, gave an artist talk at the beginning of the second or third year we were there and it was all Naruto and like dinosaurs, you know, like, I mean, you can see it in the game. When you look, you can see eco, you can see the influence of um, like when you're going up the mountain, um, I showed them all a bunch of um, media from a trip that I took to Bhutan where I summited a 16,500 foot peak. But I also showed them the scene in Akira Kurosawa's dreams about the mountain climbers who fall asleep on the mountain and the spirit of the mountain tries to, to, to drown them and make them go it's to like sleep a, so that they'll yeah, die. Light colors and uh, yeah. Yes. So all these things are yeah. in it. If you look, um, scuba diving, Matt and I were really into scuba diving at the time. So there's a whole sequence that's really like going underwater in the kelp for us off the coast of LA, which we had been doing at the time. There are a lot of influences in the game, but, but what we didn't do was tell you what to think or tell you what to feel. Um, and the most dramatic actual um, sort of thing that happened on the production was right at the end, we had a play test and I had been playtesting the game with people that were pretty hardcore. You know, they come to Sony Santa Monica hoping to play God of War, right? Or the new Last of Us, you know, stuff. And, um, they were crying at the end of their playthroughs. Like they were having emotional moments. And I was like, yes, we did it. Like we're making 18 to 24 year old dudes have feelings. This is what we're supposed to be doing. But there was a real argument in the studio about how the game should end. And Genova actually wanted it to end and you were dead. And some of us wanted it to end and you were re reborn. And we ended up accidentally, um, we had the second ending in and Genova went in and changed the ending um, over the weekend before the playtest without telling anybody. Wow. And only, ha only half of the build of the playtest had it. So we did an A-B test by accident and the second ending won. Amazing. So and it's amazing that they actually begged you for all this time for three years, you know, they kept them. Yeah, right? we, just, we just kept working on it and working on it and working on it. And I can tell you this from experience, the game was really boring, really long and very, very unfun for the majority of the production. And if you look at any of the talks that we've given, some of them, which you can see in the GDC vault, um, it was really hard. And the hardest thing for the team was really understanding that the game would get better, that it would come together. There was about a six month period in the last year of the game where some of the people on the project were really depressed and thought about leaving. Um, you know, we're coming to work, but weren't really working. And this is actually when I really realized 
that the team culture around having a conversation about something that's not working is so important because you, yes. you can show up and sit at your desk, but not work. And that that's actually really the worst kind of situation anyone can be in is feeling so disempowered and like unsure of what they're doing or how to, how to help that they just, they show up and then they just kind of sit there and then they go eat lunch and they moan and groan to somebody else about how awful they feel. And then they go home and moan and groan to everybody else, play other video games and wish they were on other teams. You know, that's like the worst situation you could possibly be in. So it was a really formative experience for Martin and I both, because we would look at the situation and be like, what can we do to fix this? How can we make each individual person communicate better with everyone else? And after we'd done that for a while, we we're like, what if we started from scratch and didn't have to do that all the time? What if we built it in from the ground up? So yeah, the game changed a lot over the three years that we made it. And it was really hard to make. I think a lot of people don't understand how hard it is to make something that minimal. You oh, know, when you go see modern when you go absolutely. see modern art, you have, have yes. to have an appreciation for the, the lack of brush strokes sometimes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Because narrative actually it's easier to write. Um, next question, uh, Rebecca, are you here? Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, continuing with the journey train of thought, uh, what was the thought process behind the multiplayer element of journey? And what made you believe that the rather silent companionship between the players will have the, desi the desired impact on them? This is actually a really good question. So Martin and I uh, did work a lot on this system because he was programming it. Um, the initial idea came from Genova's feeling that um, in the initial pitch, it was actually a pilgrimage. So it was, it was like a huge group, the, the concept of art that he showed me was a huge group of people in black robes walking across a desert through a very narrow slot in a canyon. And they had to go across these uh, sort of difficulties. So it was like, there would be a gigantic chasm that they had to somehow fashion uh, a bridge across. So it was actually kind of like Death Stranding more than more than uh, just two people. It was the idea was that everyone would be playing and it'd be massively multiplayer and everyone would have to collaborate to get to the end. Um, but the more we looked at this, the more we were like, mm, I don't know, that's a lot of work. Like I was just like, that's a lot of work. Building a massively multiplayer game on the PlayStation at that time with a team of 15 kids who are mostly only had ever worked at TGC. I was the most experienced person there and I'd only been in the games industry for six years. Um, seemed like a big, big bite to take. So then we started doing a, a top-down multiplayer game test called Dragon, where we had these 2D dots that were like tanks that moved around. So you could see the screen from the top. And the idea was when you went around, you had a certain field of view, but then when you met someone else, your field of view would expand and that would allow you to navigate through these mazes. Um, and we had a four player demo of that where it was red, yellow, blue, green. And we did a play test for that. And it was Tracy Fulton, uh, I think Richard LaMarchand and two other friends came in and saw the game. But what we did was we didn't tell them they were playing together. So we brought them in through different entrances in the building and put them in different closets essentially that were hidden around the, 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 the facility with computers in them. And then we had them play the game with each other without telling them that it was a networked game. And then we brought them all together and they were like, what the? And so then they had a conversation because they had assumed that everybody else was an AI. There were only two things you could do in that, in that prototype to communicate. You could move and you could hit the space bar. And when you hit the space bar, it said, hey, and that was it. But when you moved, if you moved on someone else's trail, you sped up. And so there was kind of like already that idea of being faster with another person. And there were dungeons and you had to like collect stuff and get the key and get out of the dungeons. And there were monsters, the dragons in it and so forth. Um, and we engineered a bunch of situations where you would have to collaborate in order to escape. And at the end of the play test, Tracy said, I didn't like having to go at everyone else's pace. I felt like I was forced to move through the environment at a pace that was too fast. And I like to explore and I want to be able to play your next game the way I play flower or flow. I don't want to feel like I have to perform for other people and it's just too much pressure. I won't like it. And we thought about that for a long time. And what we ended up finding with the dragon prototype was that four players turns into two on two or three on one very quickly. It's just really hard to make four a unit. And anyone who's studied social psychology military thought, you know, group dynamics, understands that it's really hard to build a group 
and keep that group coherent um, because of leadership and stress issues like we talked about earlier. So we, we decided to go one-on-one -on -one and we made it that you could only ever play with one other person online, but you could play with as many people as you wanted to as long as you moved around. So that was kind of the, the logic behind going with the one-on-one -on -one system. And then, and then we had a, a rude awakening because then we had to start building the game on the PlayStation. And we started putting players into this huge open environment where instead of top down, where you're only seeing a little bit, you're going over a hill and then through a dale and la, la, la. And I gave a whole talk about this at Indicade that year, but essentially it was almost impossible to get people to stay together because people were like, Whoa, just wandering around and like, hey, it's an open world. And so then the rest of the game design process from that point forward, that was about a year into the project until it, until it finished, was about figuring out how to give people a very clear path through the environment with uh, what we, you know, Disney would call weenies, you know, things that you can see in the future. In, in the future, if you continue to move forward, you'll see some flags, or you'll see, you know, a castle, you know, or you'll see a giant cloud on the horizon, or a giant dragon in the air, or whatever. Um, giving them those those waypoints with always having the mountain in the very background, just like the castle at Disneyland, so that people always knew what direction to head in. Um, and starting the game and giving them that direction was the second part of the challenge because otherwise people would just wander off from each other and never play together. Um, and yeah, to, I mean, to answer the last part of the question, we didn't know it was gonna work. And for the longest time it didn't. And it was really boring and stressful. Um, I had to organize a lot of play tests for the team where I would essentially say, okay, we're gonna play the build today. Uh, it was every Friday and nobody ever wanted to really do it because you've been staring at the thing all day and it, it's not working and you're frustrated. Um, but we would play through the build as long as we could together. And I would go around with a hat that had different tickets in it. And one was lover, one was griefer and one was loner. And so you would pick a ticket and then you would have to be that character. So if I was a lover, I have to go and find someone else and then stay with them as much as I could and sing at them and talk to them, and try to get them to pay attention to me. And if I was a, a loner, I just try to get away from everybody. But if I was a griefer, I would try to do stuff to make people fail. So like lead someone to a cliff and then run away, you know, and disconnect and like this kind of stuff. And by playing that way, we realized that we could slowly scope the features of the game set down so that we wouldn't have antagonistic situations between people, that they could only either be nice to each other or leave one another. And that leaving one another always felt some, somehow kind of gentle and a little bit like an accident maybe. Um, and then the last thing that we had to do was we had to eliminate the competitive nature uh, from the experience. And so we needed to take there was a, a point where you could basically collect as many flags as you wanted and your scarf would grow as long as you wanted. And it, it made people turn into just like, you know, they're just whipping it out and measuring it all the time. It was really annoying and really frustrating. And everybody did it. Like everyone that got in was like, their scarf is bigger than my scarf. And then they would start to fight over the, the resource and the environment. And so we removed that capacity by limiting the amount that your scarf could grow in any environment. And we also made it so that when I went up and grabbed flags from an environment, they disappear for me, but not for the other person. So you see them, even though I've still got, I've gotten mine. So I feel like I accomplished something, but then you can go and get them as well. And it really worked. It was like, imagine if you have a wallet and you can only put $20 in your wallet and then you find an extra $20, what do you do? You go, hey, there's $20 here. <laughs> Somebody should take this $20 because I can't take it. Um, and it's a very compelling lesson that has stayed with me for pretty much my entire life, that if that was how we ran things on this planet, we would be in much better shape than we are right now. If everybody had an allocation and just stuck with it. But it's very difficult to implement that uh, with human beings in a current in the current systems that we have designed. And so it was a real experiment uh, on many levels to think about the economy of journey. And it's something that I've been thinking about pretty much nonstop since we shipped the game and all the work that we've done since at Phenomena has built on that. And the next game that we're building will lean into some of the economic systems and ideas even harder than, than journey did because it's really important. Sky, which I also helped uh, do a lot of the early creative on before leaving the company had some of those ideas in it as well. 
Um, and I think that the secret to casual multiplayer games is getting rid of those urges, um, deprogramming the, the urge to, to take. That, that's a big challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it is <laughs> because we get told we get told for basically our whole lives that it's our job to do that to get ours and you know every I mean I love rap music and I love hip-hop but wow you know it's hard to listen to it sometimes because it's like well really did you need that Fendi purse is that really what you want is that is that what your life is really about you know um I think in another life I would be a monk but somehow I ended up as a game designer <laughs> Mistake. That would be our next, um, our yeah, next Zoom on. session. Yeah. My next, my next trip. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, guy, guy, uh, you're next. Do you hear, guy? Do you hear? If not, I'll ask his question. Okay. Um. So, guy asked actually. Oh, that's what, a good one. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to ask this, um, Renaud? Oh, I will ask for him. Yeah. What yeah, do you go define? Ahead. Yes. Yeah. What do you define or consider as your biggest failure, and have you learned? And what have you learned from it? Yeah, my biggest failure, probably um, in development, is that at the end of Journey, um, we were not able to revise our commitment successfully with Sony, and they wanted us to commit to making another game for the PlayStation 4 launch, and we didn't want to. So I had a very frank conversation with the team. We decided to stop paying many of the executives and we spent all the money down and we laid the team off at ship. So the day that Journey shipped, we also had to let everybody go. And I put everyone onto other teams and then we dissolved most of the executive board. Only three people stayed because the vision of the company had really veered away from where many of us wanted to go. Um, but also, uh, we had done something really hard together and I think we were kind of sick of each other, like a little bit Manhattan Project style. And I think the biggest success of my career is that I did that because everyone went off to do something amazing. Matt made Giant Squid, we made Phenomena, a bunch of people went to work on Last of Us. Um, you know, Genova was able to reform the company into something that was much more of a free to play games company with you know, all of the rigmarole that he wanted to do, you know, to move into that space. It just took them a really long time to transition and everybody grew. Um, but I also made sure that when we left, everyone would get a small percentage of the royalties. So everyone still gets little checks when, you know, when the PC version comes out and goes up on the Epic store or whatever, you get a little check. And it's not a huge check, but it's a nice to just get a little check and to remember that like, like I did this, like I did this with these people, it, it brings back a positive feeling. Um, I think that the failure was that I could not figure out how to retain the dynamic team without it also containing a lot of toxic, like water that had should have passed under the bridge, but that was not passing. Um, and I, I always wonder like, what would the world be like if I had been able to figure out that problem? But I think it's not a skill that I have even now. I don't, I don't believe that it's possible to fix a toxic environment. Um, and I think that this is actually the other, you know, it's related to the other conversation that we had. If you don't start out from the right principles and you're not in it together for each other because of love and care, um, it's just so easy for little jealousies and things to creep in. And I think game development um, has suffered from a lack of leadership because it was a hobbyist business and then became a huge business an industry in like 50 years and like really in 20 years, like since I started, it went from being like 8,000 people at GDC to 28,000 people at GDC, you know, 38,000 people now. Um, and, and that's just GDC, that's not mobile game conferences, that's not, you know, AR or VR conferences. I mean, there are just so many parts of the industry now. And unfortunately, we recreated a lot of the same systems of oppression that were in film, television, radio, and older media, and all the racism in them too. Uh, and so one of the things that's really great about now <laughs> is that we can rebuild those things in VR, AR systems, we can rebuild uh, our practices and our processes in these new industries, like working with musicians in virtual spaces, like we can make sure that we check ourselves around 
what kinds of hair, skin, and clothing are available in those spaces? And like, how do we represent different kinds of, you know, social experiences across different demographics that may all be interested in the same band and things like this. And like, there's a lot of stuff that we can do in the space to get past that. But yeah, I think, uh, I think my greatest failure was letting my team go because they had made something amazing, but I think it was something that I had to do. So uh, I really try to focus on the fact that everything is a learning experience. Yeah, it's certainly apparent in the DNA of uh, Phenomena that you presented at the beginning. So yeah, you yeah. Know. And now Kira is the next yeah. one. Yeah, Kira, uh, but just I mean, because you have like three questions, so time-wise, I think we should better focus on the third one because she kind of answered this, the, the first yes. Kira. Yes. Hi, okay. I have. Um, what do you think is the most significant obstacle that prevents women from entering the government industry? Uh, the, the most significant thing that keeps women from entering the game industry is unconscious bias about women's capability to do technical things, um, which unfortunately is why I left computer science in the first place. My background is in computer science. I am all but dissertation in artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, I'm a conscientious objector, so I left that industry because I didn't want to build drones. Um, and then I just went to video games because I figured, well, I don't have to work on games that are violent and I can just be peaceful and like walk my path in that space. But the other reason I left is because I didn't want to be the only woman. I was tired of being the only woman in the room. When I worked on The Sims, I was the only female designer on the game for the entire time that I was there, except for the first week. My friend Amy was working on it with me and then she left. And it was just me and a bunch of dudes. And um, it was really weird. It was weird being always the only woman in executive leadership, always you know, the only woman in the training about how to manage people. And, it started to become really exhausting. And so what I did was I started a series of luncheons, just a women's lunch at EA. And I just like said to my friends, like, hey, let's just get, to, let's just reserve the big conference room down there. Cause why not it's never being used? And we'll just have a ladies lunch. And then that started to spread. And then pretty soon everybody was like, why didn't I get invited to the ladies lunch? And I was like, holy shit, there's like way too many people here for ladies lunch. We need more systems, right? Um, and so you just have to kind of build affinity and community where you can. But um, the reason that I founded the program at UC Santa Cruz when I moved back to San Francisco is because I felt that the other huge issue is that access to computer science education is gated by cultural standards in the United States that are really bogus. Girls are not encouraged to use computers to program. They're not encouraged to be technical. They're encouraged to be focused on performing self and satisfying other people just culturally throughout all the media that we have. And it's, it's totally bullshit. And so what I wanted to do was build a program in the arts, which is a naturally generally more female in the United States because of just, it's okay to have a career in the arts because it's not really a career, you know, and then give those kids access to computer science education. So at UC Santa Cruz right now, uh, computer science is so impacted that if you don't test into the program, you can't enroll in engineering. But if you come to my program, you automatically get access to basic programming classes because they're, in, they're integrated into the curriculum and they're not allowed to limit that. And then I can actually work with my colleagues in engineering who are really trying to fix this problem of bias in their early classes and create entry-level classes that are taught by people that are sensitive to the cultural issues that face women in these environments and not just women. Women, people that speak English as a second language, people that are first generation Americans, people that are immigrants that have come over from other places to go to school in the United States. They all experience the same kind of cultural pushback in the typical um, canonical engineering uh, CS pipeline because it's taught as if it's a science, which it's not, it's a craft. It's also taught as if it has to be about math, which it doesn't, especially not now. You can learn to program in Roblox and Lua and never understand differential equations. And it's taught as if you have to know every single computer language on the planet. Like I learned like 12 programming languages in grad school. Like I had to write a compiler, you know, I had to, you know, do memory management and all this other crap. You don't need to do any of that to make games anymore. And like, now it's just, can you get into the system and learn how to script it and fight with the program the same way that when you go to France for the first time and you want to ask for a croissant in French, you have to remember to say, s'il vous plaît, <laughs> je voudrais un croissant. And you have to say it crappily 
and then they go, sure, I'll bring you a croissant, you know, <laughs> and you're like, Place embarrassed, and you get yeah. over it. Yeah, you get over it, right? Writing, your writing programming is, yeah, writing program is the same, is the same way. I'm like, we just need to build this kind of a vertical for people and not focus on this anymore. I love academic computer science and I think it's cool, but it has nothing to do with video games anymore for the most part. Um, you can thank Unreal and Unity and Roblox and all of the Minecraft and all the systems that will come after it um, for consistently creating more and more visual programming languages. And I think that's really, it's going to change this fact over time, but it won't change it if we keep telling girls that they shouldn't make games or that they don't belong. And so the other thing to do is to do things like this, where, you know, you can be it if you can see it. Absolutely. Um, Yaron, you're next. Hi, um, uh, Robin, just expanding on what you just said, uh, I think that uh, it should be taught elementary school and not wait till... Uh, totally, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I, be... I tried to work on this, but there was an administration <laughs> between Obama and now where that was not something that I could do. So <laughs> I was actually going to go to the, the, to the OSTP and try to work on cs for all as a, as a volunteer thing. In the White House, but um, but yeah, that uh -huh. got sidelined for a while. Actually, Asi and us just got a uh, um a grant from the Stevens Foundation. I don't know if you know to teach uh, uh kids in uh in Mina, you know, in Mid Middle East and North Af in North Africa, uh, to teach them to teach teachers how to use um, um, Unity, you know, to create games for education. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's only gonna get it's only gonna get better. It, it can't get any worse. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Still, there is Scratch. You don't need even a computer, just a browser and just. No. Yeah. Yeah. I learned how to program in HyperCard. So I learned oh, yeah. on a Mac in yeah, a visual yeah. programming language in the early 90s. Yeah. And then I just learned Pascal and then I learned C. And then once I knew C, I could do anything I wanted. And like C, fine. It was like, you know, like I remember Bjorn Schoestrup actually came to my school. I went to the University of Chicago and he gave a lecture during during one of one of my earlier semesters about C++ and Java and how he hated them and how he thought they were ruining everything because they were giving people the, the ability to write memory pointers and like just basically screw up. And he was like, you know, when I wrote B and C, I wanted the people that were using this language to be like chefs, you know, like really good. And now just anybody can pick up a computer and write something that has terrible memory leaks and all these problems, it's so frustrating. And I was like, oh yeah. Talk about the face that lost, launched a thousand ships. Like, you know, what, what, what must it have been like to be a computer scientist when there were literally maybe 300 of you on the planet and now there's millions of them and they're all making all these mistakes all the time. Think about all the wasted data and bandwidth and errors and, you know, what we've become used to because we never really made it a craft. And I think that is actually one of the failures of computer science is that we have tried to gatekeep and make it this weird wizardry thing instead of teaching people through mentorship and access and best practices that like, you know, it's actually, it's just like anything else. You gotta know your ingredients, you gotta put them together in the right order. And then you've gotta make sure that you, you know, that you understand the timing of things so that the right things are happening at the right moment. Like it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a philosophical difference. All of the stuff that, that exists now, Scratch, all these things, they come from Seymour Papert's, you know, idea of pastiche programming, which he, you know, initiated uh, very, very early on in the dialogue around comp pro computer programming at MIT. And it's just that, unfortunately, engineering and sort of architectures type thinking won out over that visual programming language. And so this whole side of the screen has just been trying to push that out. And now what's happening is it's going back because people know that computers are important and yeah. games are important. You know, they teach, they, they're they very powerful media. Absolutely. You're on only one question, yeah. okay? Because time-wise- uh, Actually, uh, most yeah. of my questions were about journey, especially uh, the last six months, and it has to do with the struggle to get everything out. And I think you've answered quite every single question that uh, I've written. So instead, um, as a parent, and I think that are quite a few parents, how would you introduce computers at home to your kids, to your daughters? I would especially Five. just give them Roblox <laughs> and say, you know, here, here's something that you can, you can play with, go find some experiences. And then I would mod something with them. Um, you know, I think that like, 
it's so easy to use to use you know programming tools. Minecraft is another great way to get kids excited about programming. Scratch is actually great. Um, you know, uh, my my one of my closest friends from grad school worked with Yuri Lewinsky on um, NetLogo for years and years and years. NetLogo is amazing. There's tons and tons of stuff that you can do in NetLogo. Um, there was actually quite an interesting push at Intel about three CEOs ago to do um, a bunch of small chips that could be used in clothing and wearables, like they were called ADAs um, after Ada Lovelace. And that initiative was pretty cool too, but unfortunately it didn't take off. Um, so the other thing to do is to sort of like maybe get a Raspberry Pi or some kind of maker equipment, like a, like a 3D printer, and then teach them how to, to model stuff and then print stuff is the other thing that you can do. Um, it really depends on the child, you know, and it, it's not gendered. Um, I think that the boys often really love the 3D printer thing, and they're now cost effective for, for, you know, a certain class of person, but they're also available in a lot of public spaces. Um, learning how to get the models off the gray, <laughs> the gray area sites and build your own, you know, drone, your own air, airplanes, your own motorized boats, like all that stuff, that stuff can be really compelling as well. So just kind of taking it to the next level or, you know, even with a Lego Mindstorms kit, right? Like it's really about finding the section of creativity that maps to the section of technical ability rather than trying to say, you have to build this, you know, this, this program, like write Hello World or whatever, you know, like most of the programming examples that we are given in programming education are really bad and they're very biased. Um, uh, one of my favorite um, sort of, interventions is that Harvey Mudd, um, they went through their CS curriculum and they debiased it and they created two programs. One is the Black Stars group and one is the Gold Stars group. Everyone in the Black Stars group already has experience programming and everyone in the Gold Stars group does not. And they separate them completely in their first year so that the people that are always raising their hand are all in the same class. <laughs> And the people that are afraid to raise their hand are all in the same class. And then they teach them differently, but they also give them a wide variety of opportunities to express themselves in their programming class. So for example, if you wanna teach uh, like simple robotic programming, you know, instructions, you can give them a task that's help these two people get this automated grocery cart through the store into their car. You can also set it on the moon and have it be a lunar rover that's trying to pick up rocks or it can be set in frozen and it can be, you know, get the snowman's cart uh, around to, you know, to Elsa and her sister so that they can throw snowballs at, at their friends. And they're all the same thing, but the way that you structure them gets rid of unconscious bias and it also eliminates stereotype threat, which the majority of our examples are in math and the majority of our examples that are not in math are in science fiction. And they have a lot of stereotype threat associated with them for people of color, women, and so on, people that are not, um, you know, Eastern European or whatever, you know, like it's just, it, it, it ends up being like this, this issue um, that we have had for so long that we can't even see it and getting rid of that is really important. So it's really just about figuring out what is the way, the flavor that they want on the instructions, not the, not the instructions themselves. Sure. Thank you. Inspiration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, ha Hava, Hava, you have a question? You're here? Yes. Okay. Um, as a designer, how would you recommend dealing with software engineers that uh, struggle to realize your uh, visual vision? And uh, when um, do you revise or insist on your graphic vision? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, usually if there's a failure to recognize the artistic vision, it's due to throughput issues or some kind of a technical, you know, sort of constraint. Um, I think the best thing to do is to have a modest vision and embellish it at the end, rather than to start with a very big vision and then have to cut it back. Um, and I think that doing more with less is just a better, is a best practice for, for visual designers. Um, you know, being comfortable with gray box and understanding that something's gonna look ugly and getting it to feel good is really important because eventually the only thing that people, in the first five minutes, the only thing that people really experience is an initial impression of the world and then the feeling of moving through it and interacting with it. And it's like, if you could walk through a portal today, like you leave your bedroom and you go into a different world, the very first thing that you would do is look, but the next thing that would happen is you would also hear, smell and feel 
and then you would try to see if you could physically move. You would t see if you could breathe and then you would see if you could, if you were smelling something toxic and then you would see if the gravity was the same, right? Like you would physically test the world just like a baby does when they start walking and moving, right? Um, your hearing and your, your sense of smell and your low level in sort of instincts around motion in an environment operate at a much rapid, more rapid pace than your cognitive ability to sort of create an understanding of the rule space. So all of your fast thinking systems get involved right away. And then your slow systems start to come in. And it's kind of like with music, you hear individual notes, but what the music is, is the space between the notes. And with video games, you see individual images, but what the experience is, is the movement through those images and the interaction with that space and its physics and its constraints. And so it's really, really important to focus on that because if you want to make something really gorgeous, like, I don't know if you're familiar with Love, Death and Robots, but you know, that's a perfect example of something where people have taken video game engines like Blur, whoever, and they're like, what, what's a short film that we could make with, you know, Unreal? And it's, it's fine, like they're fine. And some of them are, are even interesting looking. I think that they're not nearly as beautiful as say like a fully rendered, you know, four year project from Pixar or an eight year project from Pixar. But what you can see in them almost immediately is the limitation of the visuals because you're not doing anything. And if you take those same cutscenes and you put them in a video game, they look much more beautiful. And it's because you have the capacity to impact what's happening. And then the cutscene is like a break from the influence and you're just absorbing the, the story and the animation. And you're much more forgiving of the visual because it actually is better than the gameplay visual. And so I think that you really have to take something from, from watching those shorts um, dealing with an engineer that's not meeting your requirements, uh, if they suck, <laughs> like have made commitments and are not meeting their commitments, that goes back to the beginning of the conversation, which is how can you revise your commitments? Um, and how can you teach that engineer to be unafraid of saying, I can't do this, I need help. Because generally that's what is at the bottom of all problems is people being afraid to ask for help. So true, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so, um, do you still have time? Because we have about like three, four questions. Is that okay? Or uh, do you yeah, let me just. Up? I'm just gonna. I'm gonna double check my calendar. I don't think I booked anybody yeah. after you. Yeah, no, I have a meeting with Roblox after this, but it's not for another half an hour. So I've got about fifteen minutes. Sounds exciting. Um, you, Val, you're next. Do you want to ask a question? You, Val. So if, if it's not here, yeah. So let's go to Juno. Juno, and only one question, please. Yeah, actually, it's Jonna. Um, so, hi, Jonna. Um, hi, Robin. Um, so, as someone who may or may not be going into the industry relatively soon, um, I think one of the things that scares me the most, or you know, I have some concern is this concerned about an indie apocalypse and whether there actually is one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, how do small studios find a, find a space in this crowded, uh, the crowded storefronts, you know, you've got the stress of day zero discovery going on. Yeah. What do we do? What do they do? Like, you know, this is actually something that I thought about a lot as well. Um, it was actually the Games for Change with which Aussie helps organize that I, um, I spoke on the stage as a keynote and right before me was Ian Bogus, who is um, at, um, at Georgia Tech and is like a thought leader in the space of interactivity and computers, right? He writes for the Atlantic now and he's tenured like I am. And so we're both like big wig professors or whatever. And he went on stage and he said, I have a confession to make. I've made a lot of really bad games for change because games for change is code for government funded research games and government funded research games never get enough time. They're always too short. They don't focus on the aesthetics or the gameplay. They focus on some sort of weird deliverables that are aff affiliated with the contracts and, uh, and they suck. And I've made a career making shitty games for the government because that was the way that I could be a game designer and also be an academic. And everybody was like, Wow, he's honest. That's like <laughs> that's that's pretty intense, right? 
And then he said, but you know, what's happened is that games have gotten easier and easier to make. We all said we wanted to democratize games. We wanted to build systems for people to make video games in schools. We wanted to teach it. Like my very first thing that I did as a grad student that got me into the games industry was working with Doug Church, Warren Spector and Eric Zimmerman on a collaborative curriculum for teaching video games at colleges with the IGDA. So I wrote one of the very first curriculums for teaching video games. And then we held a conference where all these other faculty from different places like Tracy Fullerton, who had just started at USC and the guys from CMU, including Randy, who's passed away, um, you know, friends at like, like Henry at MIT, they all got together and we were like, how can we make this a thing? How can we make academic games programs a thing? So I started my career doing that. And then the other thing I did was game jams. So I was the first female game jammer on the planet earth, the only woman in the room at the very first game jam ever held in California in 2000. And um, at the time it was like, yeah, I wanted to democratize games. I wanted women to make games. I wanted people from all over the world to make games. I was tired of it being car guy, football guy, shooty guy, shooty guy, shooty guy, <laughs> car guy. Like it was, I loved Fatal Frame. I love these weird games on the GBA. I was really interested in Japanese games and design and I was a total fan. And I was like, why isn't this happening in the States? Like, why are all the best weird games? Like, why does Mad Maestro or Mr. Mosquito come from Japan? Why doesn't it come from the United States or Europe? And the answer was because in Japan, people were allowed to do small games on small budgets. They had modest means and they weren't trying to make it big. They were just trying to explore the medium. Um, almost every single market in the game space has avoided the Japanese model that was very successful in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Even Japan has moved away from that model, sadly. Um, and that's a failure. I think that's a failure because it doesn't make sense. And so what happened is that now you just have AAA and then you have this massive space underneath it of people that can make games with modest means, modest goals and make a living doing it and consider themselves artists. And you can participate here or you can participate here and then there's a very tiny, 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 tiny way for people that are doing kind of what we're doing, which is trying to do a balanced approach, which is focused on the financial aspect of making games, but also on the creativity. And living in that layer is very, very difficult. It's a lot of ups and downs. You're a tiny boat on the big ocean and all the boats above you are gigantic and all the boats below you are very tiny and they're hard to even know, you know, it's like, where we, where should we be hiring from? Who should we be promoting? You know, who should we be supporting? How should we be amplifying their stuff? It's just such a noisy landscape below and so intimidating above that it's like a really, it's a really interesting place to be. Um, what Ian said at the end of his talk was, we did it. We democratized games and now it's a very noisy landscape and nobody can get seen and it's hard to break out. But there's an alternative, there's an alternative take on that, which is the very first indie, indie game jam, all engine programmers, all white guys and me, all white people. The very first engine programmers, Doug Church wrote the engine for Ultima Underworld. And then you have the person that wrote the Doom engine, the person that, you know, these people, all very specific kind of person with a very specific economic background, high end, wealthy people with parents that had access to computers or their parents were in academia so they could use computers. Very, 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 very narrow number of and group of and type of person influencing a massive industry. And so what's happening now is that the rising tide is floating the boats and you're gonna get ground swells. You get something like Roblox, which, you know, when Dave and his co-founder started, everyone thought they were crazy. And now it's like a $37 billion valuation, right? You've got things like Minecraft, you know, like one person builds it, it gets bought by Microsoft, it turns into a whole system. So what happens when the people that are down here are not just the same person? One or two of them will percolate up and enable more people. And so I think that the story to tell is we've democratized it to some extent, and now we need to support the, the growth and the, the evolution of these systems with better financing, more just, equitable redistribution of wealth, and a way of approaching our hiring processes and stuff that we de bias them, then you'll see real success. I don't think it's an indie apocalypse. I think it's just the natural expansion of a tool set. Same thing happened in film with video, same thing has happened in music. Um, it just happens. The amount of gatekeeping and limited resources that were available at the time that, you know, Tim and Doug and all these people were making these game engines is 
it's it's gone. That 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 system is gone. When people ask me how do I break in, I explain to them that I came from a middle class family. My parents paid for three years of tuition at University of Chicago, which was at the time twenty five thousand dollars a year. It is now seventy five thousand dollars a year U.S. to go to school there. Wow. I graduated early, so my parents didn't have to take out a third mortgage to pay for my college, and then put myself through grad school. But I was paid by DARPA and the Rand Corporation and Microsoft to build robots. You know, I was part of a privileged system that allowed me to start moonlighting in Half-Life and start programming games as a way to resist being part of the military industrial complex in the United States. That in and of itself is a huge step up in terms of equity than, you know, than 90% of the people that I work with now. Um, so the real question is, is like, what is really happening? It's not an indie apocalypse. It's that you can't just make an indie game because you have privilege and then put it out on XBLA and have it make money because there's no other games in the store. Um, now it becomes a question of really building real art that moves people and trying to find a way to get to the people that will be moved by it. And that is the problem that artists have had for thousands of years. So I think you're really moving from an environment where it was technology first and access limited to craft first and communication oriented. And I think it's a huge opportunity for everyone <laughs> to do something new. I mean, like you're in a program, you can make anything you want. No one is telling you what to build. You have no KPIs, you have no downward pressure from a boss um, or a financer who's like, where is the money? like take the time to do something truly unreal, something really just push your imagination. Don't think about video games. Think about your favorite film. Think about your favorite book. Make a game that feels like reading me unconsoled. Make a game about the problem of immigration and um, mass migration due to climate change. Make a game where you develop an alternative technology for currency that is actually gated and limited the way that we did in Journey so that everybody can only have so much imagine a future with your games that is not dystopian, that is not a situation where some have all and everyone else has none, and where we're not fighting over these resources like water and land. Imagine those futures and the games that you build because now you can and nobody can tell you not to. And even if only 500 people or a thousand people or even a million people play your game, which is small compared to something like Fortnite, think about what an impact that has. Um, it's the best time in the world to be making video games. That's, that's an amazing perspective. Thank you. <laughs> I truly believe it. It comes out of my mouth because I believe it at every fiber of my body. So do you actually see a change, you know, uh, in, in the audience and, and the, the type of games that people actually play with or, and develop? I mean, just look at, just look at mobile, look, just look at mobile gaming. I'm just look thinking at, look at the question of women and games because they've been talking about this for, for years now, you know, and, and it's still relevant. I'm in a CEO group right now of invested, invested companies. More than half of the CEOs in this group are female. I'm the most senior, uh, myself and Emily Greer, uh, who's running a female-led mobile game studio called Double Loop that just announced an $8 million investment with Euro and a bunch of other great, great partners. Um, I think Mike and Amy at Dreamhaven are doing really great work to support a variety of very diverse ex-Blizzard teams and other teams that are building really beautiful MMOs that push the boundaries of what, of what we do and that don't rely on these like standard fictions of like Nordic mythologies and like Knights of the Round Table and this crap that we keep saying over and over again, elves and orcs. You know, I, I really truly believe, I mean, look at the Kim Kardashian game, like there's, there are so many ways people are making money in the mobile and online spaces. You just really have to stop thinking about 2000 to 2020. That time is the past. You have to think about 2020 forward and you have to look at Roblox, look at Minecraft, look at some of these other systems that are being announced. Like what is Facebook doing with Facebook Horizon? You know. What are, what are people at Google and Amazon doing with their systems in gaming and backend development? What are, like, what is Stadia going to become? It isn't what, it, what they said it was gonna be yet, but it's gonna become something. You know, what is Apple gonna That's be changing. announcing it, yes. you know, you know at, 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 their, at their developer conference? You know, there's yeah. gonna be 
more and more and more technology, and more and more ways of interfacing with the with with reality than ever before. And we don't have to think about the games from the last 20 years. We don't have to think about those at all. Like the most popular game on Roblox, some of the most popular games on Roblox are very basic concepts. One is like build your boat for treasure. You just build a boat, you race, and if you win, you get more stuff and you just keep building a better and better boat. It's kind of like SimCity, I guess, yes. in a way, maybe. It's kind of like Car Guy game from forever ago in a way but it's so fresh or like survive the disaster. Every 15 minutes, there's a different disaster. Who's the last person standing, you know, or adopt me. Like you get to be the baby and I'll be the adult. And I'll push you around in a stroller and buy you stuff. Yes. I mean, that's amazing. And that comes from the mind of a 12 or 15 year old kid, not from someone my age, who's sadly still thinking about Mr. Mosquito that nobody remembers. <laughs> so we have new producers. Wow. Well, uh Thank you so much, Robin. Renard, you want to say a few words? This was so inspirational and insightful and, and so many other amazing good things. Uh, well, it was really a pleasure to speak with you. I'm, I'm so glad that you invited me. And it's my, it's my fondest and most sincere wish that you all make something that surprises yourselves. That's fantastic. Oh, yes. Renard, you want to say a few words? Uh, well, I would just pass a message from Shai, our student. She couldn't be here today, but she said you are truly, truly an inspiration for little, little girls growing up in Rishon Lezion, which is a suburb of a suburb. And uh, you really, you inspired her in, a, in the games that she is doing, and she will obviously see the, this, the video recording and uh, will be very, very thankful to you for, for all the things that you said. I truly believe it. It's been a long career for me. It's been a, it's been a ups and downs and all kinds of ins and outs. And Everything has changed from the day that I started thinking about video games as something that people made to where I am now. And it just, if we can make this much change in 20 years, think about how much of a positive impact we can have in the next 20, you know? We really need to be building systems that teach people how to get along with one another, how to survive what's coming from the sky. We're gonna need, we're gonna need to work together to get through this next 20 to 50 years. And so this is something that games can help teach and I hope that you can in some way. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You have a fantastic week. Okay. All right. Have a good day and you all have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.